Louder with Crowder Studios, protected exclusively by Walther. And Betty! We have a very uh, yeah. special show for everyone uh, out there today. It's a little bit different, yeah, and we are going bit. to have some announcements uh, regarding Mug Club. While everyone else is kind of shutting down, slowing down, we've been taking the precautions. We're going to do more to serve you, but I don't want to waste time with that right now. We'll have another video on that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring on a very special guest. Uh, full disclosure, this is why I brought him on. I know him. I love right. him as my own personal uh, doctor. Yeah. He's an internist um, in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's been practicing for 21 years, uh, and he does. I, I want to make it clear. Well, first off, Dr. Choi, thank you for being here. How would you describe what it is that you do? Because when I went and saw you, you did all kinds of different things, and it was very weird to me that you were a doctor who actually listened. Well, what I do is uh, what basically other internal medicine doctors do. I'm a doctor for adult and board certified in internal medicine, and so I serve as a primary care doctor for my adult population patients. Um, so with that, I mean, I'm supposed to be a jack of all trade or at least know something about everything. Right. And then uh, specialists are the ones who just delve into one or two, uh, one or two uh, field right. of the uh, vast uh, medicine uh, fields. So uh, cardiologists only deal with the heart. Uh, I may deal with a little bit of cardiology, but a little bit of kidney and a little bit of everything else. And uh, do- Dr. Choi, I'm, uh, I'm detecting... Yeah. A little bit of an accent. Is that is that Polish? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think I'm Chinese, but I'm Korean. So Ooh, that- I have a small Korean accent. I came to the States when I was uh, 11 or 12, almost 12. So I've been here uh, about over 40 years. Now, good Korea or bad Korea? Uh, supposed <laughs> to be good Korea, so South Korea. Okay, right? supposed right to be, now, yeah. They're the good ones. <laughs> well, you know, uh, ignorant American. So you, like a- you probably have some unique insight um, because the, right now when we're talking about, you know, coronavirus, Wu flu, all this, it's as much of a cultural and economic, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a ripple effect as it is just medical. So, so being from, from South Korea and obviously a long-standing sort of, I guess, feud, for lack of a better word, with, with China, mm, yeah. do, you, do you feel like you have a little bit of a, a different insight into this? Well, in some ways, in the sense that uh, I, do st- I still have some uh, family members in Korea, uh, including my brother, who went back uh, after growing up here. So I've been actually talking with my brother, so I have uh, some ideas to what's been going on in South Korea in, in relation to uh, COVID-19. And you know, I think their relationship with China right now is uh, probably on a, on a good term, uh, at least uh, related to the virus. Mm-hmm. So the Chinese have, uh, uh, they've uh, actually uh, released a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, info on the virus to South Korea. And that's why they were able to make uh, the uh, the kits to rapidly test a lot of their uh, population. I'm talking about South Korea. So right. they got the sequence of the virus from uh, China uh, in uh, sometime in uh, first part of uh, January, and that's what they used uh, to actually uh, come up with the kits. Now, when did we get that in the United States? When did do we know when China sent it to us? They may be working with the uh, U.S. FDA to try to uh, get those uh, kits approved so we can use it here. But uh, that's a hearsay. I'm not sure. Right, all right. Well, okay, so we'll go back to that with South Korea and the United States and sort of the CDC. I know you and I have talked about that a little bit. But before we get to that, there's there are kind of two sides here. There's there's pandemonium, there's panic with some people, and then there are some people who think that there's nothing going on at all. We've maintained that, listen, take the proper precautions, but we don't want to cripple the entire economy. Yeah. <laughs> there's somewhere in the middle. So for, for people who may not be in the know, as someone who has had to deal with this yourself, how bad is it the coronavirus how should people be viewing this right now okay uh, the coronavirus is a virus much like the flu but it is more it spreads faster and the mortality from the coronavirus uh the uh, novel virus is higher than a flu partly because we don't have any vaccine for it and we don't have any treatments because it is so new 
But it is, a, we do need to take this seriously. I mean, this is a national uh, emergency. We do need to take this seriously, but this is not like a nuclear fallout. Right. This is not gonna last five years, 10 years. We don't need to be panicked. We do not need to hoard toilet papers. You know? <laughs> we don't need to do yeah. that. Uh, yeah. This is going to pass. This is going to pass, but we just need to actually follow the instructions from the CDC and our government and actually do our part. Right. And we can hopefully get through this with a, the, the least uh, amount of uh, mortality. Right? We can only do that if we actually follow the instructions. Right. Yeah. And speaking of hoarding toilet paper, I'm the worst person for that because my dog Betty she eats toilet that's her thing she, she does, loves yeah. toilet paper rolls I came home uh, yesterday I'm like that's Betty that's my 401k that's gone completely <laughs> she just chews in the toilet paper and throws it all around um, well th th that's important but right now obviously people are th there's a difference between the blame game and then finding out how this happens so we can avoid it in the future because now there's a lot of you know sort of Monday morning quarterback where people say well we should have known uh, what do you make of a lot of people right now blaming uh, President Trump and this administration that they haven't handled this properly. It's that, that's what they've been trying to claim in the media. I, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and uh, whether uh, our president could have done a better job or not, I don't know. You know, but the hindsight is twenty twenty. Right now, what we need to do is actually <laughs> follow the recommendations that are given to Mr. Trump from uh, his uh, experts, the mm -hmm. physicians, right? And right now, the best thing is. To, stay away from each other. Just stay away from each other so that we don't spread it. Hopefully if we do that, we can actually uh, dramatically curtail the uh, spreading of the virus so that in a month or so, we will still have uh, some cases, but it will be much less. Right. If this works, then we can really get it under control. So, I mean, that's the key. Right. It's about flattening that, that, that curve. And I wanted to ask you, going back to that, well, first off, you said novel coronavirus. And I think a lot of people don't know this. You know, I have a, I, I clean my wrestling mats. I have a home gym with uh, an industrial cleaner, and it says on there, kills coronavirus. I think some mm -hmm. people may be ignorant to that. Like, the coronavirus has been around for a long time. That's why you said novel coronavirus, correct? Can you explain the difference for folks who may not know? Well, we, you know, we've had a coronavirus for a long time. But this is a, a mutated, is a different strain, basically. So we've had the SARS, SARS-CoV-1. This is, uh, we call it SARS-CoV-2. So this is a uh, new strain. It's mutated. Okay. So we've had a coronavirus for a long time. This just happens to be a, a different strain, and it is more potent than the SARS. And we know that because it has caused more death, and the spreading is faster, and it spreads a little easier, uh, a little easier. Wait, more deadly can, than SARS? Like we, we had SARS in the Toronto airport. You know, I was from Canada. The mm -hmm. coronavirus is more deadly than that? Because I read different mortality rates. Yeah, right now the mortality rate is, uh, they're saying, uh, as high as like 30%. Yeah. So, which is higher. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. And that's that's predominantly, obviously, people who are elderly and people who are have pre-existing conditions. They're the ones who should be most concerned. Exactly. The younger patients... Uh, you know, younger patients really have a good immune system and we can fight it off. And almost most of the cases of the, uh, the COVID-19, the symptoms are very mild for uh, by and large, most people. They get it, they'll, it'll be like a, a flu-like symptoms and they'll get a uh, little fever, some cough, uh, and then they'll recover. Right. It's the elderly patients and the people with uh, immunocompromised states like diabetics or heart disease, mm -hmm. I am supposed to be a little bit of a higher risk now because I had a heart attack at the beginning of this year. So people with heart disease uh, or cancer and so on, those folks are at a much higher risk of uh, dying from it. So I saw some statistics the other day and people over the age of 80, mortality is as high as about 15%. Right. And people in their 70s are about 8%. Below that, I mean, the mortality is very low. Right. So. Yeah, it's predominantly for the elderly folks. So really, they need to they need to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. let me let me propose this. This is going to be something where people get really upset. This is this is just what we've had to handle in the office. So let me explain <laughs> why I'm saying this here, and you can shoot me down if this is totally out of left field. Uh, here in the office, we've made sure that people are basically quarantining themselves outside of the office. 
and then we come to the office because we're a small enough company. Mm-hmm. We can keep track of it, except for some older people. And when I say older, I mean like 58. So they're not really yeah. at high, high risk. But we wanted to take precautions, keep them away. Correct. And I wanted to do a Corona pact where we all licked a pop, popsicle <laughs> stick so that we could just get it over with. Yeah. But no one else would sign. Apparently, my lawyers, that's a liability. <laughs> so, uh, but here, in, in looking at that, here's my question. We're talking about quarantine in the whole country. What about just quarantining Old people, eh, old yeah, people, yeah. and people who are sick because you know I'm reading the, in the UK they want the herd immunity where they want it to get to 60 percent of the population, and obviously that's 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 an asshole thing to do if you allow that to happen and old people who are at high risk are exposed. But it seems to me that maybe instead of quarantining the whole country, if we quarantined people who are most at risk, let the virus run its course, so people are no longer carriers. And then let them out of their their cages. That maybe that would <laughs> yeah, be a better that's a good way to uh, frame approach. It, I, this is just a layman. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> what do you think? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what is this a South Korean Yosemite Sam? Oh, what is he gosh. doing? Wait, does that come on? I mean, no, nothing. There's nothing to that. Is that, I'm not saying kill them. I'm saying just keep them safe yeah. because uh, otherwise they're going to constantly be exposed to this virus until we get a vaccine, right? For them, it's still obviously less risky, but it's not any less dangerous if they contract it four, five, six months from now. That's the concern, not so much for young people carrying it. So just quarantine, uh, you know, old people. No? Well, I mean, well, that's an interesting idea. Uh, that's an interesting idea. But the Part of the problem is I don't. We don't know how long it's going to take if we take this approach to get sixty percent of the uh, general population, young people, uh, to actually uh, get infected and recover from it. Is it going to take uh, six months? Is it going to take uh, three months, six months, or a year? Right. So from the logistics standpoint, you know, how do we quarantine somebody for six months or a year? Right. Yeah. That's that's one thing. And then two, we still have young people who can die from this. Right. And yeah, do we really want to run the risk? I mean, uh, so is it kind of ethical? Mm. Uh, so we're probably going to try to take the approach where we're going to try to minimize the spreading of the virus and let it kind of die off. Well, they're, do- they're doing that, but there's the talk virus. of. Yeah, yeah, yes. The vi- yes, yeah. the virus. Yes, no, yes, one's, yes. no one thinks that <laughs> yeah. you were. Well, we didn't bring on Dr. Choi Vorky in, okay? We understand. Um, yes, but we're looking right now at trying to stop the spread. And then the talk is mm-hmm. if it doesn't work, full quarantine. And so I'm saying before that, quarantine most at risk if we're going to go that route. And again, some of this is hearsay, but I mean, that's that's pretty scary to a lot of us. And I know, um, you know, you probably have some more insight on this. When people point to South Korea as being successful, y- you and I have spoken about this. It's a very different culture and the kind of approach in South Korea are not measures that necessarily would be acceptable to Americans or or work. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, you remember, uh, Korea is a very small country and it's very uh, centralized government. So, I mean, they can mobilize much faster than we can in some ways. Mm-hmm. And the people are very densely populated. And this is why the, the using the masks and so on worked. It was probably necessary for them mm-hmm. uh, because they're in a crowded place and they're always going to be in contact with somebody. But for us, maybe like in some, somewhere like in New York, perhaps, you know, that might be an issue. But like in Vegas, where, where I'm at, w- the density here is very low, so we could actually stay away from each other much easier than uh, people in South Korea. So we don't really need a mask. Yeah? Right. We don't really need a mask, at least not right now, because we can't get the virus just standing out here, and it doesn't exist in the air by itself. It has to be transmitted from another person uh, to the next person. Now, see, I think this is important. This is why I wanted to have you on. There are conflicting reports where some places say it is airborne, and then some places say it's only transmitted through contact. So it is only through some kind of contact or, or you know, sort of contact by, by proxy? Well, contact, mainly what we're thinking is that uh, it is by contact. Like you know, if we shake the hands of, of another person who has a virus, or if we actually touch the uh, surfaces uh, soon after uh, somebody who has a virus touches a surface and then we touch our face with it. Right, right, right. Because it enters through our eyes, our nose, our mouth. So it's, it's a respiratory virus, but mm. we, we can also get it, it can be airborne. It's typically not, it can be airborne or droplet. So if somebody coughs at us, and then we can actually inhale that, and we can get, a, we can get the virus infection. Oh, okay. Or, right, so the person who has a virus has to be in close proximity and cough. 
Okay. And then we can actually cough, you know, cough up the virus, and then we can actually inhale that. So if that's and airborne, that's pretty temp- that's pretty temporary. It would actually have to be like you're talking about, you know, um, uh, basically a fine mist. In other words, it's not yeah. necessarily airborne just because someone was breathing there 20 minutes ago. No. And it does become airborne. It does become airborne in the cases where, like in the hospital, if somebody has the uh, virus, and if you use uh, like nebulizers you, or if you're like you're suctioning the airway, mm-hmm. so, uh, that can actually make it uh, airborne. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it doesn't last very long. I mean, it's not going to be in the air uh, for a long time. Okay. Uh, it's going to die off. So uh, you have to come in contact with somebody for a, a significant amount of time uh, in order to actually uh, uh, inhale now, and get the uh, virus. What about you being a doctor? Do you wear, I notice you're not wearing, you don't look like Bane right now. I notice that you're just n- yourself. Do you wear a mask right now all the time when people come in or, or a um, respirator? No, absolutely not. No. Okay. Well, what, you um, seem no. pretty bold with that. I, I would be scared. Uh, why, <laughs> yeah, <that's> just, <laughs> why not? Why not? Well, at least in uh, Nevada right now, even in the hospitals, we're not routinely putting on masks. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we've actually locked down the hospital, so there are no visitors coming in. And and then even the staff, everybody is screened with uh, uh, questions and uh, the, the, to see if they have fever or symptoms. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if they're dealing with a patient, remember, I'm sitting here and I'm not being exposed to anybody right now. Right. So there's absolutely no reason for me to wear the mask. It is not going to accomplish anything. <laughs> Because there is no coronavirus in the air right now. Right. It's only if I'm in the close vicinity with a patient who actually has symptoms or who actually has an uh, infection. So if I'm actually treating a patient who has symptoms of potential coronavirus, mm-hmm. then I will actually put my N95 mask on. I'll put my gown and gloves on. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not uh, putting any uh, uh, personal protective uh, 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 gears or PPEs, equipments. Right. And what kind and of that's ge- these, that, that is the CDC recommendation. CDC recommendation is that the uh, general public does not near the, need to wear the mask, at least not yet. And the healthcare workers, we do need to wear it if we're dealing with the patients with the COVID-19 or suspected patients. Right. But it seems I've also read that really the reason they're telling people not to wear these masks is is more so because of the shortage that they're still if you if you have them, that it's not a bad idea to wear them. Um, but specifically, if you have the virus that you should wear the mask yourself. And then if you don't and you're around people who do, that's where you want the uh, the N95 respirator. That's about correct. Right. OK. All right. All right. Yeah, I was sorry, that wasn't really I mean, much of a question in there. That was that was my fault as an interviewer, not yours as a doctor. You can diagnose me as a. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you just need to be safe and protect yourself. Which, hey, Doctor Choi, are you uh, protected uh, online? Do you protect yourself online? Because the good news is ExpressVPN anonymizes right. everything that you oh, do. They man. encrypt 100% of your data. Mm-hmm. They were voted the number one mm-hmm. VPN uh, on the market mm-hmm. by Radar, Wire, and uh, The Verge. And they haven't oh. had any break-ins like uh, data breaches like uh, other, uh, other ones, VPNs right. out there. Mm-hmm. And people watching right now can go to expressvpn.com slash Crowder to get uh, an extra three months mm-hmm. free. So, Dr. Choi, if you're not protected online, that's uh, expressvpn.com slash Crowder for an extra three months free and you can use it on all your devices so that people don't know what you're looking up you know that you're South Korean your mistrust of the Chinese government they could be keeping a you know. watchful eye on you they're none the wiser if you use ExpressVPN um, let me ask you again about about South Korea do you think that also I mean we're, we're kind of joking about this but their somewhat mistrust of China having worked with them for such a long time uh, helped them get ahead of the curve because they were skeptical or uh, in looking at the information presented to them whereas here we'll get into it the CDC in China has been a been a nightmare as as far as the false info i think they do have a little healthy uh, skepticism the korea mobilized really qu- uh, quickly and early on and it's just massively tested a lot of people and they were tracking every case to see like the for instance uh within 24 hours uh within uh, like about four hours to uh, 24 hours they'll get the result mm-hmm. and if somebody does have a uh, covid 19 the they will actually track use all means to track where the pay, uh, person actually went to. So they'll look at uh, their uh, credit card spending. They look at uh, 
GPS systems to see where that patient went to and then uh, actually let the public have that info so that hmm. the people can avoid where the patient went to. So they uh, apparently they use that system rather nicely to uh, slow down the uh, spreading of the uh, virus rather right. than massively quarantining, uh, quarantining uh, everybody. So effectively, the South Korean government doxed its citizens, yeah. and that's, <laughs> yes, that might be something like. that Americans aren't super comfortable ri- with, right? The, Correct. If the American, so in other words, when people say, look at South Korea and the failure, and this was the question I was getting to, well, why did it take this much longer? People are saying we're more inefficient here in the United States. I think the answer to the question is, to all Americans out there mm-hmm. watching, are you comfortable with the government tracking you using GPS and mm-hmm. releasing that data to the public? Because that's how South Korea got ahead of it. Oh look, he's on. You're a busy man. You're on your phone. Is that what you're doing? You're t- no. Have I bored you this much, <laughs> much Doctor Troy? I, I get that. I'm just I'm just a, a basic yeah, yeah. Caucasian here. But come on. <laughs> you're the most boring person I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, uh, I go in. He says, "How do you have a show?" <laughs> this is what is your host? I don't get you're it. You're not funny at all. Um, no, but that so that is the end. They literally were tracking and then releasing that information to the public to have that those kinds of results here, which would be harder because it's much bigger. Yeah. The United States government would have to do that with its citizens. Well, plus it's a much, much bigger uh, country, and we're a much bigger. <laughs> this is a, geographically we're much bigger, and we're also a very diverse uh, uh, population. Mm-hmm. So it just doesn't. It's not going to apply what they what they've done over there. It just doesn't apply here. Let me ask you this: You were talking about you know when we were talking about people sort of blaming Donald Trump, and you said, well, no, really, it, the CDC doesn't have a whole lot to do with President Trump. The CDC also wanted to correct me if I'm wrong, go into China and offer help a while ago, and were denied. Correct. That's uh, that. That was the information I had. It's a close to society, uh, China, right? So right. They probably just don't want to accept uh, help from a uh, Western uh, Western country. Right. Uh, and- yeah. Well, and what we've been told in the media is, is you know, that President Trump told the CDC not to prepare. Now, as someone who's, is, it any, is, is that true? Is there any truth to that? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't understand why anybody would tell the CDC not to prepare. That's a... Uh, right. Yeah, well, that would be awfully unusual. Yes, it would be awfully unusual. <laughs> and typically speaking, the CDC doesn't really have a whole lot to do um, directly with the president in that capacity. I know they mentioned the pandemic task force. Uh, our team and uh, the guy who was there said, "No, that's actually not true. We weren't disbanded at all. We were we were streamlined." Um, and this is, I guess, a question as someone who works in medicine, right? And we've seen this with psychology, psychiatry. A, a lot of Amer- and we see it now with the media. A lot of Americans don't necessarily have uh, the greatest amount of faith in their institutions. And we've seen, for example, the FBI and the DOJ. They can be politicized. Is that also possible with agencies like the CDC, because we see, or or the World uh, World Health Organization? Do sometimes these Different organizations have different political agendas where it makes it uh, hard to sift fact from fiction. I'm, I'm sure every organization, whatever field it is uh, they're in, probably does have some, uh, uh, they can be influenced uh, to an extent uh, by uh, politics, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure that's just, a, uh, that's just the way it is. Right. But, but I would imagine an uh, uh, organiza- organization like CDC would be much more driven by scientific uh, data and for the uh, public good. Yeah. And CDC has been sending, uh, you know, I do get a regular uh, update from CDC Mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis about the uh, COVID-19 and what we're supposed to do. So, I mean, it's not like they haven't done anything. They they have been doing things. Initially, um, we didn't have all the uh, proper information from China. And so we probably, we thought this wasn't a, a huge deal. And then later on, you know, we thought, oh, you know, it's spreading in uh, South Korea and uh, uh, Italy and Europe. And we start getting more concerned. Uh, but we still didn't have a lot of cases here. And uh, as far as we know, uh, really no death until I believe uh, beginning uh, uh, recently. And that's when I always start saying, okay, you know, it's actually uh, spreading here too. And right. that's when we start getting much more concerned. Right. And so I think this is important to note. A lot of people think that the United States is unique. We are unique in a way that you've sort of drawn attention to. We're large, we're, uh, we're very diverse compared to a lot of other countries, but we're not unique in that up until more recently, globally, this wasn't seen as a big concern based on the information that we were getting from China. Everyone was kind of in that boat until not too long ago. The World Health Organization declared a pandemic on, I believe, the 12th, uh, March 12th, wasn't right. it? Uh, 11th or 12th, 12th. Uh, so, you know, well, that's, 
that's I think that's when we really start getting uh, concerned, and uh, the schools were shutting down, and uh, uh, Nevada is on a basically a, a kind of a lockdown uh, mm-hmm. at this point. All the non-essential uh, businesses have closed as of yesterday, and all the casinos have closed. So only the essential um, businesses have stayed mm-hmm. open, such as uh, medical practices and the gas stations and uh, uh, the food uh, uh, places where they, you know, like the supermarkets right. and so on. What about uh, what about weed and hookers in Nevada? Are they still in business? Is that business considered is essential? Booming, man, still going. Uh, that's I, I guess that's me around since the uh, humanity. Since <laughs> <laughs> the beginning yeah, of history. Yeah, but it's not human history. It's not <laughs> taxed <laughs> everywhere, so I don't know if they're open. Uh, you know, you have drive-through dispensaries there in in Nevada. Um, I think that sort of answers my next question then, because it matters to get to the root cause of. Why did people not think this was? And uh, honestly, it doesn't, like you said, this isn't uh, the kind of pandemic that is going to kill 20% of the population like people have misreported initially. But the reason that people didn't take it um, as seriously as maybe it has ended up being is because of the information we were having. You know, according to the uh, Dr. Leung, who was actually the uh, epidemiologist who dealt with the SARS in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and he said that with this COVID-19, the mortality can be as high as 40 percent and 60 uh, percent of the world population in a in the worst scenario in the worst scenario or 60 percent of the world population can be infected and of those 40 percent mortality can be up to 40 percent that's wow. the worst scenario but but you know we also know from what the south korea has done and also what china has done it can be contained it can be controlled and we can actually uh get through this uh, without that kind of devastating number. Mm-hmm. And this is why this is why the U.S. is now taking the uh, this uh, drastic measure where we're actually trying to uh, uh, do lockdowns and have the people not come in contact with each other for about a month to try to avoid that kind of uh, potentially uh, having that kind of a uh, pandemic. Right. And Right, and I don't think we're going to have that because we are already taking uh, measures. We're taking right. measures, so I seriously doubt we're going to have a, anything close to that. Okay, so we don't need to be panicked. We don't need to be panicked. Right. The best thing we could do is a uh, simple, um, uh, what's that? A simple uh, measure such as washing our hands very frequently and uh, don't touch our nose, don't touch our uh, face without washing. Right. And wash our cell phones uh, frequently throughout the day. And if, we, if we're out, try not to t- touch you know, public uh, places and just try not to go out if we can for a while until we get this under control. Right. But I really doubt we're gonna have a 60% of a uh, US population uh, infected. I really doubt we're gonna have 40% of those uh, uh, dying. I, it, we're just probably not gonna see no, that because no, we're of course jumping not. on this. But that we're does sound like, uh, from what you're saying, that means that playing a good old game of uh, head and shoulders, knees and toes, Eyes, ears, mouth, and Correct. nose is out. Mm-hmm. That should be none of that. Um, let me. Dang. Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, you're killer at that game. I mean, it's not even a game. I thought it was a limerick. Yeah. But, but um, <laughs> as as a practitioner, how urgent is it for you to get the the testing kits? Because that that seems to be the focus in the media right now. It's, well, we don't have enough. We don't have enough testing. Um, sounds to me like maybe you're saying it, that's not as necessary as taking these these precautions and these measures or have you been disappointed in the lack of of testing kits available why don't we have testing kits it sounds like we've sort of answered it by the root cause of not having the right information but as a practitioner what what's your point of view on that i do i do have some testing kits now okay i do have some testing kits initially we were rationed uh, about five uh last week but we now actually have uh probably about 20, 30 of them. Oh, well, that's and, a big, that's uh, a big increase. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think a lot of people, mm-hmm. Dr. Choi, yeah. don't, don't skim past that. <laughs> don't get, don't play coy. Most people think that there are no testing kits available. That's a, that's a four or no, five no, fold no, increase. There, there are, no, there are testing kits. There are testing kits and the hospitals are testing. And so we're going to have a, a mobile testing uh, places apparently where we're going to be able to test people as they drive through, just like they did in South Korea. So, right. you know, uh, so we're gonna have those, so we will have more kids. So it w- it's coming, but we still need to try to slow down the spreading by staying away from each other. I get it. We can't be touching our faces. I understand this, Doctor yes. Choi. I get it. I, I thought I didn't know you were a pediatrician, um, but uh, <laughs> but this is so you're like like a, sort of like a taco truck, but for coronavirus testing kits. 
Correct. Okay. Good. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, yeah. they're actually going to uh, implement uh, uh, mobile u- uh, units, apparently, or something. Do you know why so. you went from 5 to 30? Is a big part of that because they've been recruiting sort of private laboratories now, too, um, to assist in creating more testing kits? Correct. So uh, the big um, private labs like the Quest, LabCorp, uh, they have the capability of uh, doing the te- uh, tests. And uh, now the... Uh, uh, They've had approval from the, I think, FDA uh, or CDC uh, clearance to use uh, more of the regular swabs to test. Okay. Mm. So that's that's why now we have uh, more kits. Now, why was that not approved before? What's the difference between the regular swabs and the other swabs? Well, I think they just didn't know if it was going to work. And so they, they probably had to test it. Okay. So and, yeah. it seems like there's a lot of red tape there. Um, and it seems like this is a good thing, though, that at this point, had we relied only on the, the federal government, we wouldn't be able to get as many kits this quickly. So having private laboratories work in, in um, yeah. you know, sort of in tandem with them seems like, I mean, you went from five to 30. That's that's a huge bump. Correct. Yes. OK, so that's good. So there's a silver lining there. And I do, you know, I want to ask you about uh, your health. But speaking of which, you, I see that you're drinking coffee. But I don't think you're drinking uh, uh, the right coffee. We're going to send you some with uh, Black Rifle Coffee. You know, yeah. they're veteran owned um, and they fresh roast it, ship it to your door. They're huge. They have the balls to sponsor this show. They do. And uh, they're offering a discount right now. People go to blackriflecoffee.com slash Crowder. Use a promo code Crowder. They get 20% off their first purchase. I'm a big coffee snob, Dr. Choi. And uh, I don't like what I'm, what I'm hearing about what you're drinking there at the office. That, to me, is more concerning than Corona. Yeah. It's not cool. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, bad coffee will kill, right? Yes. yes it, well, there, there's mold. There's mitotoxins. I know. I read Dave Asprey. I know what I'm talking about. Um, are you a medium roast or a dark roast guy? Duck roast. Dark roast. It sounded like you said duck roast. Duck roast. Oh. No, all right. Okay. This is yeah, me. my accent. Yeah, have, have a little. F- <laughs> so you've been in the United States for how long? 42 years? 43 years? That explains it. The accent only goes away at 44. Uh, 44 years. Yeah. You're just under the cover. One cutoff. more year. Yeah. One more year. <laughs> you, and when, when, you let, when that just happens, let my French Canadian mom know because <laughs> she still hasn't figured that out either. Th- um, but Dr. Choi, uh, you just you mentioned this sort of nonchalantly that you had a heart attack. Um, that was a big surprise to me when you, when, when you told me that. And I think it's a big surprise to people watching. I mean, you're a trim guy. I've always known you to stay healthy. How, how, and you eat pretty pretty well, and you certainly have, have helped me. With, how, did that, how did that happen? A, a relatively young, fit, healthy guy have a heart attack. Well, um, doctor, I heal, uh, healed thyself, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I had a high cholesterol, and I thought I could uh, control it with a diet and exercise, which I've been doing. And uh, obviously not, that's one. And then uh, two, you know, my job is very stressful. Mm-hmm. And then three, there's a... a family history of early onset heart disease and I kind of ignored that I guess uh, so a combination of all of those uh, probably led to uh, the uh, early uh, heart attack and do you think you you maybe ignored it because you felt so good and you were kind of fit and spry you thought like oh, I'll be fine correct because uh, I've been eating healthy and I've been exercising with a trainer for a long time many years and you know I run on the treadmill I don't have chest pains and I feel okay so I thought I was okay uh, obviously not. <laughs> but, uh, you know what? That brings me to an interesting point, and I, I think it may also relate to this, you know, the COVID-19. But um, how important are genetics uh, in, in health? I think often we overlook that. Uh, for, well, first, let's start with that. Genetics, how important is that? Because that seems to be the sort of new frontier with health. Genetic testing. Mm-hmm. Now they're even talking about gene doping, which I don't understand. But I mean, genetic testing is... It is important that that's kind of the uh, the uh, the direction a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the new technology is going to, to try to figure out what medication actually works better for this particular individual based on their genetic uh, disposition. You know? mm-hmm. uh, so that, uh, that we've been doing a study on that for quite some time, and there are companies out there who are testing uh, uh, to see which medication I should be giving uh, uh, each individual because you know there are like maybe there are ten different medications for one condition. And they all they may not be all equally effective for a particular individual right or one may or some of those medications may cause more side effects on a particular individual and uh, we are actually trying to figure out how to uh, uh, test right uh, do genetic testing to uh, to apply to that but you know it's, we're still in a, uh, we're still not there uh, in my opinion but 
it's getting you know it's getting more accurate. And my second question is because you said you have a stressful job. Um, mm-hmm. How much of an impact does a lot of people think about diet and exercise? How much of a physical impact? Because stress isn't seen as a physical thing, right? You get in the gym, you get in the treadmill. People go, okay, I'm physically moving, or I'm physically moving this way to bench press, or I'm physically putting this food in my mouth. Stress is sort of conceptual for a lot of people. How much of a physical impact does stress actually have on one's health? Because of stress, we know that will uh, it will uh, decrease the e- uh, immune system. Mm-hmm. Stress will decrease the immune system. So, uh, obviously, uh, if your immune system is lower, then uh, you're more likely to catch the uh, virus. Not just coronavirus, but any other virus, right? Right, any yeah. Any other uh, in, uh, infections. Yeah, but this podcast will be titled about coronas because that's what sells. So, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we talk about. Who cares about the old, right now. the old normal <laughs> flu? Um, so, so that's something that's known right in the medical field. I mean, that's a physical observation. Stress lowers immunity that can be quantified. Yes. And um, I, I guess what other, in closing here, what other tips would you give if you had to tell, we get it, wash your hands, social distancing, but is there anything else that you think maybe some people can take as extra steps or they're, or they're missing either, uh, whether it's lowering stress, whether, are there any supplements or anything that you think might be not, we're not saying any of this is a cure, but is there anything that you would also advise on top as supplementary measures for people to take precautions? There are some, there are some uh, data or suggestion that, uh, the zinc may help because uh, there are some uh, studies that were done uh, where the zinc has shown to slow down the uh, replication of the uh, the RNA uh, from the virus, okay. uh, intracellular uh, replication. So the zinc potentially may help, um, but there is no absolute data that says it does for right. the uh, COVID nineteen. But generally speaking, you know, it may help. So sure, it's not going to hurt to take some uh, zinc uh, supplement. Okay, and there were some initial. Uh, there are some uh, antiretroviral medication, HIV medications, uh, were used with some success in treating the patients, but that's in the hospital. Right. Or uh, anti-malarial medications such as uh, Plaquenil, uh, which is a uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, they've also used that in South Korea and in China to treat the uh, uh, severe cases. Well, I just and read about that today, and that's relatively new. How does that work? Like you're saying, this anti-malaria medication, because it seems like there's a lot of promise there, and it's it's a little weird to me that they've been using it for a while overseas, and it hasn't really been discussed until this current 24-hour news cycle. There's some mechanism, apparently the uh, chloroquine or the hydroxychloroquine may assist in the transport of the uh, zinc from extracellular to intracellular where it is needed to uh, stop the replication of the virus. Hmm. But that might be the uh, mechanism. Okay. I'm, to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure. Right. Uh, but uh, but that's uh, that may be the uh, uh, mechanism. But they have been using it to some degree of success. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Uh, at least the report from South Korea and the China. Uh-huh. Well, I trust the report more from South Korea than China. <laughs> if it was only coming no, honestly, from China, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> South Korea, you know. Guys make good phones. Uh, you know, I've, I've never had Korean food that I didn't like. Um, you know, the Samsung Galaxy 7 exploding in people's faces. You have to admit, that's, that's one for you guys. That was a little bit of a mess up. But aside from that, we've had a pretty good relationship with them. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Cho. I know, I know that you are a busy man uh, and you have a lot of patience to get to. So please, do uh, take all precautions that you can to stay safe. I know I'm saying this. You're the doctor. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's anything that, uh, that happens that's new that you think the public should really know about, please do mm-hmm. let me know or let them know because people are desperate for information out there right now and they're looking right. for non-politically charged sources mm-hmm. to give us the straight uh, straight story and i think that's very hard to come by right now unfortunately all right yes well thank you very much he sometimes is a man of few words and then sometimes yeah. is a man of intense mockery did you notice that <laughs> yeah he finds the words when he's mocking me uh for everyone watching right now we appreciate we really uh, appreciate you taking the time and um we'll Stay have some safe. big announcements here uh coming from mug club uh and the kind of content that we'll be doing for everyone out there when everyone else is uh, stepping back i think we're going to be stepping up and um trying to make it worth your while because we know that a lot of you are lonely out there and we want to help with that as much as we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. Everyone else, we'll see you next week. 